morning. Good morning to all uh, to those who are here uh, joining us in our worship service and also to those who are online watching us. Uh, let us worship together uh, the Lord for this is the day the Lord has made. And today, um, the holiness is motivated by a love relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Not out, not out of fear um, of the law that um, the Old Testament has shown us, but it is because of the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand as we sing the hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Any time like this, I want you to take a few seconds to praise God in your heart. I don't know the trouble that we are facing before you come here this morning. Or problem you are facing in your life. But God is real. He said, cast all your burden upon him, for he cares for you. So I want you this morning to lift up everything in your heart to him. For he is here, right where you are. As the deer panted for the water, so I was so pondered for thee. We praise and adore you, O God, this morning. We acknowledge thee to be our God. 
we worship you, O God, for you are holy. You are mighty and you are worthy. We praise you for we are fearful and wonderful made, O oh God. And we come before you this morning to say thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. The amazing and marvelous grace. We thank you for our lives. And Lord, we thank you for the air that we breathe. We lift up our life to you this morning. Let your Holy Spirit impart us as we share your word together. And Lord, we lift up our pastor to you as he come to teach us your word. May each word that comes from his mouth and his meditation be acceptable unto you. And Lord, we lift up our members who are not able to come and join here this morning, wherever they are. May the Holy Spirit of comfort be with them. We lift up our former member who are outside from us to you. Especially, O oh God, we lift up the Swashes family to you as they are facing a difficult moment. For you are God, a sovereign over everything. You said in your word that give thanks in every circumstances. That's what we are, giving thanks to you in whatever that comes to our life. We thank you. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be a sovereign over all of us as we come before you to share your way together. By the help of the Holy Spirit, touch our heart and our mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. The scripture reading today is from Romans 13, verses 8 through 14. And if you're looking at a Bible in front of you, the Black Bibles, it's page 948. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, please stand with us again as we continue to give praise to our God, worshiping Him through our songs and through our music. Um, for He is a holy God.
Take my life, O oh Lord God. Everything and all that is within us, O oh Lord God. May we be found, O oh Lord God, worthy in your presence. Good morning. Good to see you all. I want to start out with a couple of announcements before we get started today. Um, first thing is online prayer meeting. It's open to anyone in the church. It's on Wednesday night. It starts at 8 o'clock, goes till 10. Uh, the reason we set it up for two hours online is so you can come and go at whatever time you need to. 
Uh, those of you that are committed to the 9 o'clock dinner time, join us at 8. Those of you that are putting your children down at 8.30 or 9, join us at 9.30. Um, some come and stay the whole time, but let me just encourage you, if you can, it's by Zoom. It's sent out to everyone in the church on the email list on Tuesdays, the Zoom information. Uh, feel free to join us any Wednesday, even if you just want to come once and try it out or come once a month, but we'd really love to have you with us. Usually we're anywhere from 15 to 25 people. And so let me just encourage you, if that's something that may interest you, uh, join us Wednesday nights, Okay. Um, the other announcement, and I'm only speaking to those of you here in person today, uh, I think probably by Friday this week, we were telling people they were going to need to sit in the foyer. I'm talking about during the first service. And so let me encourage you, those of you who the first service and second service, it's the same. We can come to either one. It really doesn't matter. Register for the second one. I'm just saying that creates space for people to come to the first service, especially when this is the only service there's time for children. So if you don't have children, and really for you, it can go either way. Uh, let me encourage you just as an act of service to other people in, the, in, in our church family uh, to consider the second service. Now, if you don't consider it, I'm okay with that too. I'm just planting a seed. For those of you that it applies to, please take heart. Others of you don't, it's fine. Uh, feel free to go to whichever service is best for you, okay? Just letting you know of the situation and the need. And so as we continue, let's pray, and then we'll get started. Uh, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word that reveals things to us that we cannot know on our own. You are our creator. You know exactly how we work. You know how you've intended to draw us to yourself. Father, we just pray that today... Uh, that, Father, somehow you would minister to our hearts, that you would guide us into uh, the Christian life that you've intended for us. Father, show us the freedom, uh, show us the love, show us the grace, Father, that, that makes the holiness possible. And so, Lord, we just thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. His name was Gustavo. He had been abandoned by his parents when he was young. As far back as he could remember, he'd been a foster child. And this is how it usually went. He would get moved to a foster home. And in the beginning, in his heart, in his mind, his hope was that everything would go well. And it usually did for a while. But finally, the rules or sometimes in a bad situation, even the abuse would start happening. He would respond with rebellion or disobedience. And in the end, it would end like all the others did. He would get kicked out, moved on, and he would end up in another foster home. And the whole process would start over. On his file, they had written, he can't live with anyone. And so it just went through it. Six years old, eight years old, 12 years old, 14 years old, 16 years old. Until one time he showed up at the Daly's house. And they were strong, but they were kind. And they were firm and they were fair. They treated him with dignity. The longer it went on, it was almost as if they loved him like their own son, which was a totally new experience for him. And so what happened to Gustavo? Well, eventually it became contagious, and he was more obedient, and he was more kind. And I know it's a stretch, but in his mind, he was thinking he was actually becoming loving. Now, if you actually talked to Gustavo about what was happening, he would bring it down to the love, not the law. Uh, Josh McDowell has a well-known quote. Let me see if I can move this real quick. Rules without relationship bring rebellion. So those of you that are parents or future parents, this is something it would be great for you to grab onto. Rules without relationship bring rebellion. But in Gustavo's case, somehow, even though he had lived in all these houses, it took the Daly's home who finally gave him the love, but yet the structure that finally won his heart over. That was the situation. Because in this situation, even though all the other houses had given the rules, the more he began to walk in this new home, he began to notice that he was doing the things that he had been commanded to do all those other years in the other homes. 
he was still doing the same thing. It was not saying there's no standards and there's no rules and there's no point you need to live up to. But he now realized it was no longer because of the law and the rules. It was because of the, the love. Honestly, that's the gospel. As Christians, or if you're here not as a believer yet, we look at the Old Testament and we see the law. We see a lot of it. But then we get to Christ and we see the love. Now you may be thinking, okay, but how do these two work together? Because sometimes we go to this extreme and it's all about love and I mean all about law and legalism. And then we, or we go to this extreme and it's all about love, but there's no standard there. I mean, either extreme is not a good place. And so God avoided the extremes. He gives us his law to clarify or to make clear what holiness is. You could say he gave us the law to make holiness clear, but he gave us love to make holiness possible. Let's rewind that. He gave us the law to make holiness clear. Like, what is it? What does it look like? How do I recognize it? But then he gave us the law and gave us love to make it possible. I'm going to come back to that several times today, but there's a difference there. And so um, let's, let's walk backwards a little bit. Uh, we're in the book of Colossians. We've been here for a while. We'll be here for probably another month. In the book of Colossians, here's a glimpse of the city of Colossae. What had happened is there was a man named Epaphras, and he had come to the city of Colossae, which would be in modern-day Turkey. He had heard the gospel previously. It's very likely from the Apostle Paul. It seems to be that he had been discipled by the Apostle Paul. He came to Colossae and began to tell people about the gospel, and people believed and so then he brought them together and started a church of new believers. But very early in the process, you have false teachers that join the church and begin to teach things wrongly about Christ and wrongly about salvation. So if you're Epaphras, what do you do? Well, who trained you? Paul did. And who's more qualified than the Apostle Paul to enter into a discussion with false teachers? The only problem was the Apostle Paul was here in Rome. That's over a thousand kilometers away. And that's far enough in our day. But in their day, that was a really long way. So Epaphras travels to Rome, meets with Paul. But Paul can't leave. He's in prison. And so Paul, being the spiritual grandfather of this congregation, does all he can do. He prays and he... Let me walk us through this. He writes... That's what we have. We call it the book of Colossians, but in reality, it's not a book. It's a letter. It's merely a letter from prison in Rome, from the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae. Young in their faith, but false teachers have come in, really confused, don't know who to, who, who to, who to believe. And so Paul is writing into that situation. That's what we're reading. Now, as we talk about that, we must remember every scripture has a context. I know sometimes maybe we sit down in our devotional and we read the words and we kind of read it and then we just move on. But every scripture has a context. Every, every scripture has a, has a situation. And really that's happening on both ends because every scripture is written in the midst of a situation. So the more we know the situation, it helps us understand what's happening. What does it mean? But you and I are also living in the midst of a situation. That's more the application side of it. You don't just read verses to read verses. You read scripture so they can minister to our heart and change us in the present life, whether it be with our children, with our spouse, with our roommate, with our coworkers, with our neighbors. God has given us his word out of a context so we can understand it better into our context so we can apply it better. But just realize God's word is not something that really doesn't apply to real life. It came from and continues in real life. It is for real life. So as we continue today, we're going to be looking at Second Col I mean, Second Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. It says this, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. 
or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. In their day, to seriously want to follow God and to be Jewish was a very difficult road to choose. The reason I say that, in their day, the Jewish laws had rules. This is how you wake up. This is how you dress. This is how you groom yourself. This is how you eat. This is what you eat. This is how you prepare. This is how you do business. This is how you plant seed. This is how you harvest seed. This is how you read scripture. This is how you pray. It just went on and on and on and on. If you seriously wanted to find the way to get close to God in the Jewish mindset, the burden was almost impossible. No one could perfectly obey everything. It was constant legalism. Constant fear. Did I do it right? Did I do it wrong? Did they see that? Did God? It was just constant, constant, this burden that you could not bear. I mean, that's why Jesus came and said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because I am gentle and humble in spirit. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus was coming and presenting something that was drastically different than they knew. Their version of religion was so heavy that almost it was a curse instead of a blessing. So just note, that's the background. And it is very near to what the false teachers were bringing into the church because their mindset was, well, if Jesus is a Jewish Messiah and you want to follow him, then surely you must also become Jewish and follow all of these Jewish rules. And you had many people, Jews, but mostly Gentiles in the church of Colossae. They didn't know anything about that background. All they knew is they had put their faith in Jesus and he had forgiven everything and he had brought them in. And now all of a sudden you're hearing about all these rules and baggage and bondage. And you're thinking, what in the world happened? And so Paul is writing into that. So let's look at these verses again. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question. Let's just stop right there for a second. First word, therefore. Whenever you look in the scripture and you see the word therefore, basically it means because of what I just said, I now say this. That's what the word therefore means. And so for you and I to start in verse 16 and just go ahead is not really the best way to do it. We need to hesitate for a moment and say, okay, he started with therefore. So what did he just say? Paul had just talked about how in the midst of our sinfulness and our guilt, we've been forgiven and our debt has been nailed to the cross. That was the idea in the previous verses. It's the idea of there's nothing that you can, and I can do to earn salvation, but in the midst of our sinfulness, Jesus came, died on the cross to pay for our sin so that if we would put our trust in him, if we would put our faith in him, if we would trust our life into his hands, then we would be forgiven. And all the debt of sin that we owed would be put aside because Jesus paid for it on the cross. We would now be counted righteous. It's done. There's not more love to give. God has already given us the full amount of his love. There's not more Holy Spirit to receive. God has already given us at salvation the full amount of the Holy Spirit at salvation. It's done. So based on that, Based on the fact that you have everything that God has for you, based on the fact that you earn nothing, based on the fact that it's impossible to earn it, it's only a gift, based on all of that, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you with all their rules, because that's what it's going to go on to say here. Let no one pass judgment on you. Now, when we read this, I, I think our first response is, okay, I'm going to tell them that they can't judge me and I'm going to make them stop judging. And first of all, that's impossible. You can't keep somebody from judging you in their minds or even in their words. We can't control people. But when you go back and look at the transla translation, another way to translate it is don't take it to heart. Don't listen to it. Don't believe it. When you hear judgment, when somebody brings it against you and brings some kind of teaching or guilt that is not in line with the gospel, you set it aside. Don't take it to heart. Don't let it in. 
So then he goes on to explain, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. Paul is just talking about the rules. Now, it's interesting if you want to dig deep on some of these terms. You know, you had unclean f- food. You had clean food. You had uh, how you had to wash your hands before you eat the food. You had um, how you had to prepare the food. Just a lot of rules came out of the Jewish background. Um, you get to festivals. You had Passover. What was Passover? Well, before I give you that explanation, let's get down to verse 17. These are a shadow of the things to come but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, I'm going to explain that as we walk through this. Passover. What was Passover? It was a meal that remembered what God had done for them centuries before when the Jews had been slaves in Egypt. And the last plague that God brought against the Egyptians so that they would set the Jews free was the death of all the firstborn sons. They, the Jews knew it was coming. And so God gave them the word, if you want death to pass over your house and not to come to your house, you're going to kill a lamb and put its blood above the door. And that's what happened. Any home that did that, death just passed over and didn't, the, the first son did not die. Now, what is that symbolism of? Who's the lamb that shed his blood so that death would pass over us? It's Jesus. I mean, you see John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus in the New Testament, says, uh, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was the ultimate Lamb who shed his blood to save us from death. And so the false teachers were saying, you have to obey and observe all of these festivals. Well, what was the purpose of the festival? Looking forward to Christ. Well, I already have Christ. Why do I have to observe the festival that tells me about something that's going to happen when I already have him? It's the same with the other festivals. When you go on, when you walk down the festivals, uh, the, the Feast of First Fruits. It, it's interesting. Sacrificial lamb was, was for the Passover was killed on Friday. Passover was Saturday. Sunday was the day of first fruits. Talking about harvest and provision, God's provision. Well, that was a day that Jesus was resurrected. It was the same days. And Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, Paul describes Jesus as the first fruits of the dead. Once again, what was happening? No, you have to observe the festival that tells us about the Messiah that will come. But why? I already have him. And so as you walk through the festivals, we get, keep coming back to verse 17. A shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. We already have Christ. And so the false teachers just kept saying, no, you have to do this. Um, let's say even the, the new moon or the Sabbath. I didn't know much about the new moon. The new moon festival, what would happen is it's every month. And you would have messengers who are looking in the skies, watching for the new moon. As soon as they see the the sliver or the first little indications of a new moon, they would blow trumpets, they would light torches, and every mountaintop with cities, they would see it, and everybody would start lighting their, their torches. Trumpets would blow, no one could work, the families came together, the communities came together, there was a sacrifice that was given, it was a reminder that we're coming back to God, it was a forgiveness of sin, but once again, what was, him drive, what was it driving them towards? It was Christ, the only one who can truly forgive sin. That was the new moons. You get to uh, the Sabbath, and some of us are somewhat familiar with the Sabbath. You see it in creation. Day seven, it says, Jesus, I mean, God rested. Now, did God need to rest? Does God get tired? I'd say No. But he was introducing the idea of rest or ceasing to work. Now, what is that driving us towards? Now, remember, what was the Jewish religion like with all the law? Was it rest? Would you put the word rest with the Jewish observance of religion? No, there was nothing restful about it. It was earning, be good enough, try to do the right thing so I will find favor with God, which was impossible because we're all sinful. And so who is Jesus? Jesus is our true Sabbath. 
Jesus is our true rest, where we cease working, earning, trying to be good enough. That's been put aside. We have been granted salvation by grace through faith, through Christ. It is a gift. The working has ceased in regards to trying to earn favor with God. And in Christ, we now find rest. That is the idea. All the way through this, the religious leaders were saying, no, and you have to observe this and this and this and this. And Paul is saying, all of those are forward-looking to the Messiah, and he's already living inside of you. Don't let them judge you. Don't take what they're saying to heart, because what they're saying is not true. That is not the salvation that you know and the gospel that you put your faith in. We continue on to the next verses. It says, let no one disqualify you. It's the same idea here. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in details about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. Asceticism. Was, we probably don't use that word too often. Here's the definition. Severe self-discipline and avoiding of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. That would have been like the monks in centuries past. Uh, some would call them the desert fathers, where they would leave society, which they felt was too much of the world, and they would go out into the wilderness somewhere, build a monastery, and there many times they would deprive themselves of sleep, they would deprive themselves of food. They would get to the point where some, in very extreme cases, would even beat themselves trying to hold down the fleshly desires so they could find God. It's the same idea they were saying here. Maybe not the same expressions, but basically they were saying, no, your life is too simple or too good or too comfortable. If you're going to really follow God, your life has to be difficult and plain and simple, very, very simple. But once again, what is that? It's law. It's law. It's an effort to somehow live in a way that God will be happy with how you're living. But there's arrogance in that, even though it's not visible from the, from the surface sometimes. The arrogance is thinking that you and I could actually be good enough to earn God's favor. There is no way that you and I will ever be good enough to earn God's favor. It is a gift that has been granted through Christ. God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the whole good news of the gospel is that knowing there was nothing we could do to ever be good enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't memorize enough verses. You can't give a big, big enough offering. There's nothing that will ever earn favor with God that will be good enough. Now, those things should flow out of our lives because of the love relationship we have with God, but that's no longer a burden to carry. That's a joy to give. Now, as we continue thinking about this scripture, um, we move on. Asceticism was one of the things that was mentioned in the previous verse. Let me take you back for a second. Uh, worship of angels. The situation there was the Gnostics believe that there's no way that we deserve to be in the presence of God. So we can't really pray all the way to God. We have to go through an intermediary and the intermediary is the angels. So because we're not deserving, we need to pray to and worship the angels. And somehow that's eventually going to get on to God. But angels are the intermediary. And so there are a couple of problems with that whole idea. First of all, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth in their life. There's no other intermediary to God except for Jesus. That's the first thing. They had stripped Jesus of everything that he was in their teaching where he could not even be the Savior. And so Paul is trying to restore that. First of all, angel worship, put that away. That's not necessary. The other thing they were talking about, well, we are so lowly, we don't deserve to come into the presence of God. I think we would all say an amen to that about the deserve part. But that doesn't mean we can't come into the presence of God. 
Because of what Jesus has done, in Hebrews we are told that we come before the throne of God with confidence in our time of need and receive grace and mercy. I mean, maybe sometimes we try to stretch it. Well, I'm going to try to get my life right and behave better so I can come into the presence of God. But that's not what this says. Hebrews talks about, no, if you are a believer, if you are in Christ, if you are a child of God, come before the presence of God with confidence in your time of need and receive grace and mercy. When you see that with those words at the end, receive grace and mercy, when, when do you and I need grace and mercy? I mean, we need it all the time, but specifically when we're at our worst. Most of the time we think, well, I'm not fit to come before God. I'm going to wait till I'm better. But God is inviting us in to give grace and mercy. We need grace and mercy when we're sinful, when we're fallen, when spiritually we've fallen on our face again. The same temptation, the same struggle. It's in those moments God is still inviting us in. In those moments when we think he should just slam the door and turn his back. He is still inviting us in. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe your week didn't go too well. And the same temptations came up and you fail again. Just know the door is not closed to you. It'll never be closed to you. Um, we, we get a little bit of this with the story of Esther in the Old Testament. If you remember the story. Esther was the Jewish wife of a Persian king. Mighty Persian king. Now he didn't know she was Jewish. And so another one of the advisors of the Persian king had put a law in place where on a certain day the Jews could be killed and all their possessions could be taken. The king had stamped it but didn't really know what the law was about. And so Esther hears about it and she has to somehow intervene on behalf of her people. And so the plan involves going before the king to plead her case. The only problem is you can't go to the king unless he invites you. And if you appear before the king in his throne room without an invitation, you will be killed, whether you're the queen or anybody else. And so she decides to risk her life to go before the king uninvited. And the only way she could be spared is if he extended his scepter, meaning a pardon, that she would not, her life would not be taken. And so that's what she did. She went before the king. And thankfully, by the grace of God, the scepter was extended and she was pardoned. But I think from that story, we can join that with this scripture in Hebrews and realize God has invited us in, first of all. And we can come into his presence knowing that there is a king who sits on the throne whose scepter is always extended. Always extended. On your worst day, my worst day, his scepter is extended. On the day that you definitely and I definitely didn't stand up for the name of Christ or we definitely didn't obey or we didn't look anything like holiness. His scepter is extended and he is inviting us in to the throne room to come into his presence in our time of need, not just on our good days, but on our bad days and know that we will find grace and mercy every time. They were being robbed of that. Because they were told you cannot come into the presence of God and you got to go through the angels. We continue on going on in detail about visions. So they're saying, okay, you're not, uh, your life is not simple enough. That's asceticism. The worship of angels, you're not worshiping angels. You're not seeing visions. Basically, your faith is not worth anything because it's not described with these several characteristics that we, of course, have in our lives. It was just judgment. When it starts out disqualify you, I mean, we're hoping they weren't getting to the point where they're getting pushed not just supposedly out of the faith, but out of the church because they didn't measure up. But it's interesting, these next several verses here, what are the characteristics of the false teachers? It says they're puffed up without reason by their sens sensuous mind. Basically, pride is taking over. They're arrogant. You would hope that the more people come into the presence of God in an sin, uh, authentic, sincere way, that it gives humility. Because the more we see the greatness of God, the more he increases, the more we decrease. The more we realize how great he is, the more it puts us in our place and we realize how great we're not. 
we realize that everything we have depends on him. The closer we get to God should result in a humility, not a pride. And so for a false teacher to stand up and the pride just continue to grow and to grow and grow. And I know any of us can struggle with pride. But the characteristic should be the closer we get to God in our relationship with him, the more that humility becomes a characteristic of our lives. And that wasn't the case in the false teachers. And then it goes on in verse 19. And not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. What, what it's saying there is this. If you're sitting under a teacher talking to them who is not connected to the head, who's the head? Who's the head of the church? Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head. We are the body. If we sit under a teacher who is not connected to Christ, then that's the end of that. Because how the body grows is its connection to Christ. And so that would be like saying a body is going to be grow, grown when the head is not connected anymore. Physically, that doesn't make sense. There's not even life in it anymore. A body detached from the head. And so Paul said, just giving them an image, saying if you have somebody who's teaching... And they're not connected to Christ, who is the head, through whom a growth of the body happens. Then you just know you're listening to a false teacher. Don't worry about it if they're saying, oh, I'm going to disqualify you. Don't really want to be with you in the first place. Because it's not the body. It's not the gospel. It's not with Christ. And growth will not come. You and I, just like the people in Colossae, must listen to the words of Paul and realize we have to be connected to the head. Our teachers have to be connected to the head. As parents, our children need to see us connected to the head. As we are connected to Christ, we are trustworthy. As we are not connected to Christ, we aren't. Now we go on to the next verses. So, sorry, with the wrong direction. Here we go. Last set of verses. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Paul is saying, after you've received the freedom, after you've received the love, after you've received the forgiveness, after the Spirit of Christ has now come to dwell in you, why would you go backwards? Why would you not go back and start making Christianity this, this religion of rules and judgment and pressure? And why, why would you go backwards? Why would you go back if you've been given something so much better? The false teachers sounded like they were wanting to be close to God, but it was all based on human effort, rules, be good enough. But once again, we come back to the point where we realize that even the most, stricted, most strict life, maybe you've done it before. I mean, I've been there before where you fall into temptation and you come up with this super new plan. You know, I'm going to get up super early and I'm going to read my Bible and then I'm going to memorize scripture and then maybe I'm going to do some fasting and then I'm going to try to be more generous. And we pile on all these rules to somehow work in our own life the power to be close enough to God and overcome our temptation. And Paul is saying rules will never bring holiness. It's never going to be enough. The reason is this. In James chapter 1, we see this. We see that each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own evil desires. Where, desires, where do desires come from? The heart. Who can work in the heart? You and I can. Heart is, you could say, God territory. God is the only one who can change the heart of man. You and I can be strict and ascetic and as hard on ourselves and strict and legalistic as we want to. But that in itself will never change our hearts. Our hearts are only changed through Christ. 
And so once again, rules, legalism does not bring salvation. It also does not make us close to God. But if you go back to the story of Gustavo that we started with today, he realized that he was now doing all the things that had been demanded of him before in the, in the very legalistic, almost abusive homes. He was now living at the same standard. But how did he get there? It was now love. When we're talking about love today, it doesn't mean lower the standard and we can do whatever we want. But it's saying this, if we are truly in a love relationship with Christ, it should result in holiness, but not because we're scared or not because we're afraid, but it should result in holiness because God is working in our desires and our affections. And the more that we come to know him, the more we desire to walk with him. It's a holiness that comes from love, not from the law. I want to close with this. I have several screens. Just going to walk through real quick. When others give a negative opinion of your faith, how does it affect you? Think about it for a moment. Do you fight? Are you angry? Are you embarrassed? Are you convinced that they're right and you're wrong? Do you change your story? I don't, I don't like totally believe it. You know, like I'm not like a fanatic or anything. I'm a, what, what do you do? Do you, do you spiritually backpedal to save face? Because really that's some, 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 something like what was happening here. It can come from within the church. It can come from without the church. When people question your faith or judge your faith, how do you do? Do we cling to the truth of the gospel or are we easily won over to their opinions or their ideas? As believers, ultimately, the ultimate standard for us is God's word. Are we familiar enough with the gospel and who Jesus is that even when people bring judgment in an unbiblical way, that we can still stand strong with the truth? Or are we easily swayed away? What happens if you're, let's say you're in a, a small group with other believers, but you got somebody in the group that talks really loud and they're really convincing and they're really smart, but they're wrong. Will you bow your head and say it's okay and you're probably right? Or will you actually even be won over because you didn't know? May that not be our case. May we be a people that walk in God's word enough, are familiar with the gospel enough, are familiar with our fallenness enough, are familiar with his love enough, are familiar with his law enough, because law has a role. Remember, law clarifies holiness. It makes it clear, but it just doesn't make it possible. We need God's word, but we need his love to make it possible in our lives. So that's the first thing. Some would call this fear of God versus fear of man. Do you go climb in a hole and try to pull back and not be embarrassed? Or are you still able to proclaim the name of Christ even when somebody's bringing some problems? Holiness results from salvation. It doesn't earn it. I don't know how many. Maybe I'm just talking to a few of you on this point right here. Some of us are waiting to say, you know what? I'm going to give my life to Christ. I will put my faith in him once I get my life in order. That's basically saying, once I'm good enough, let me make some changes, give me some more time. Once my life is good enough, I'll put my trust in Jesus. Let me just tell you, that is totally incorrect. There is no way that you and I will ever be able to get our life right without him. You will be waiting forever. It works the other way around. That in the midst of our sinfulness and our fallenness and our selfishness and our arrogance and everything else, we come to the point where we lay that whole situation before him, giving him permission, giving him ownership, where we're saying, God, my life is now yours. It's a mess, but it's yours. And God takes that and changes it. You don't get good and then come to God. You come to God and then he will work the good in you. If you're here today and you're ready to put your faith in God, but you've just been waiting till your life is good enough, let's just throw that idea out and may today be your day of salvation. Let's go to one more thing and we're finished. It is love, not law. 
that drives us to holiness. We're not saying we're not supposed to be holy. This isn't this fluffy mercy, grace thing, everything's okay, everything's not okay. We are sinful and we are fallen and without Christ, we're in trouble. But we have Christ and he will continue to transform us. And the more that we get in his word, the more that we spend time in prayer, the more that we surrender more and more of our hearts and lives to his lordship, we find the sweetness of the love of God. And in that, he continues to shape our affections and our desires to fall more and more in love with him like he already is in love with us. Are we called to holiness? Yes, we're called to holiness. But it is driven by love, love for God and love for neighbor. Where we still live a holy life, we still have very high standards in our lives. But God makes it possible through his love. That is a gift we've been given. We must avoid the false teaching because the real teaching is so much sweeter. And God has invited us in. May that be who we are. May we be a people who dwell, enjoy, thrive, revel in the love of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we just... um, We ask that you would reveal your love to us, Father. Father. Our mind cannot even begin to understand the full size completeness of your love for us. And so, Father, we just pray that somehow, Lord, even today, that you would reveal your love for us, Lord, that you would remove the false teachings from our mind and our hearts where we have to earn it. But, Lord, we would just be so amazed by this undeserved, unconditional, never-ending love that you've given to us. And, Lord, it would so stir in our heart that you would move us to a level of holiness and goodness and love of you and our fellow man that we've never known before. Father, please, may love be the thing that moves us forward in our Christian faith like never before. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Yes, Lord, this is the desire of our hearts, to be holy, to be set apart, to be ready to do your will. Be with us, Father, as we depart. Help us as we go in our respective ways. Help us not to forget that you've promised always to be with us, that you've declared in your word, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Thank you for that glorious assurance. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a good week. Keep safe and see you next Sunday.